Hello everyone, how are you doing? It's great to see everyone here. Um, <clears throat> so welcome to uh, Jim and E's virtual panel, uh, Mindset, Skillset, Toolset, the autonomy of a successful sales team. I am Tom Lavery, I'm the CEO and founder of Jim and E. Uh, today I am moderating and hosting the event. Uh, super excited to welcome a brilliant panel of Chris, James and Kirsty. They're going to introduce themselves in a minute. So thanks for everyone who's joined. Um, before I hand over to them, I just wanted to do some quick introductions and housekeeping. Um, so we're going to make it a bit interactive today. It's going to be, there's going to be some polls before we go into each topic, which is exciting. So we want to hear from you guys. Um, so there's a Q&A function in Zoom. So if you have any questions for the panelists, you can go through there. And then we'll jump in and answer any of them as we go through, or we'll try and deal with them if we have a little bit of time at the end. Uh, so, great. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to the panellists. So, first of all, Kirsty, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? I do. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kirsty. I am VP of RevOps at a B2B SaaS company called Signal AI, based out in Old Street. I uh, joined it as a, a team of one sales ops person four years ago, and I've kind of seen it grow from a 60-person company through to a global, uh, well, three-region, 200-person company. So it's changed a lot along the way. Uh, I also co-founded the UK RevOps Network, so kind of live and breathe all things RevOps. And great to be here. Thanks for the invite, uh, Tom. No, thank you, Kirsty. Uh, yeah, it's great to have you here. Um, Chris, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Hatfield. I'm the founder and coach of Sales Psyche. So we support sales and commercial teams, mental health and mindset. Um, very big passion of mine, which you'll probably hear a lot of today, um, having experienced anxiety very early on for my, my sales career and then founding Sales Psyche just over two years ago. So um, yeah, really excited to be here and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. It's great to have you here. I know you're doing some awesome work in the in the whole space and you're getting some great traction around kind of uh, people thinking about their, their mentality and mindset, which is fantastic. Um, <clears throat> James, last but not least. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So um, really nice to meet you all. It's great to be on there. Great to do it to you in pound today. I am a UK and I sales director for Aircall. So I am um, about six months into Aircall, having spent about four and a bit years at what used to be known as Facebook, um, now Meta, helping to grow out their sort of first B2B SaaS um, business. So we're, we're sort of new on the ground in UK and I, uh, Aircall has historically done everything from Paris and we're now starting to um, to change that and, and make ourselves sort of a bit, little bit known in the, in the UK market. So it's a very sort of topical time for us to come and have this conversation. We're trying to build out most of these things in our team um, right now. So sort of excited to um, start to be part of the panel and, and hear some ideas from, from everyone else as well. Cool, thank you guys for the introduction. I think what, uh, obviously I'm really excited about the topic today. I think it's really interesting, but obviously we've got a really diverse panel with lots of different experiences um, and coming from different backgrounds. So I'm really excited to see what you guys say. Um, so we're gonna kick off each section, I believe, uh, with a poll. So the first poll uh, is, and the top first topic is, uh, what is the most important characteristic of a sales, <clears throat> of, of sales mindset? So you've got a few multiple choices there. Um, obviously, we're, we're going to go around and hear from the panel and get their view, but we'd love your viewers and audience as well. So if you can just take a second uh, to tell us what you think um, and go from there. I've, the first time I've done a poll on Zoom, guys, and it told me I, as a host, I can't vote. So yeah. there's something new I've learned today. Uh, cool. Um, I'm sure we'll see, I'll see those results come up in a second. Here we go. Cool. Uh, motivation and resilience are coming up on top, which is interesting. I would have clicked resilience as well. I think that, not to touch on what you say, Chris, uh, all the time, but mindset and mentality is probably so important as much as skill. Um, but guys, I, I want to hear from you. So uh, first of all, let's get, why don't we start with you, Chris? What do you think is the most important characteristic of sales mindset? Yeah, I think there's there's two or three that stand out for me. I think resilience that you've already mentioned, and it's great to see that a lot of people are on that that same wavelength as well. I think there's a balance here, of course, of of being able to go through those those challenging moments and those experiences to be able to build that resilience and and better build your your craft around your sales approach and and what you do individually or as a as a company as well. So I think resilience. I think people often misunderstand resilience as well. It's mm -hmm. not about being strong. It's about being flexible and adaptable. It's not about being gritty. It's about knowing when to persevere and when to 
step back and also resilience isn't just about you it's about other people and it's being mindful of you might be resilient to things and change but being mindful for how others adapt to it as well and being able to communicate that so it doesn't just seem like you're this naturally resilient person that no one is of course so I think that's the big one and then the two others I think self-regulation doesn't get talked about enough talk a lot about self-awareness understanding your emotions but self-regulation is all about how do you manage those emotions you can understand when you get nervous stressed anxious but if you can't manage them they will always overpower your skill set and stop you from operating to your full potential and then finally I'd say growth mindset and people often say I've got a growth mindset but growth mindset comes down to do you appreciate the process? Do you look for the, the learnings from it? Or are you all focused on the outcome? A lot of people might think they've got a growth mindset, but when they actually look at where their focus is and, and what they look to work towards, they probably would find very differently. So, yeah, I mean, I could, as you know, I could talk about this all day, but that's just my, my snapshot of some of those things. I, I think that's really interesting. You're talking about the perception right, of like what resilience and motivation means, and you're coming at it from a completely different angle, which is super interesting uh james do you want to go second on this like yeah i mean i'm glad that motivation and resilience were the ones that came out on the top because those are the ones that i would have i'd have clicked if i'd been allowed to vote um but the um i think yeah to, i mean to, to chris's point i think the a lot of this comes down to really um the ability to perverse to persevere and the ability to sort of motivate yourself when um when the outcomes aren't always going in the in the direction that you, that you want them to um i think particularly as a salesperson, a lot of your success and failure can be can be in the margins, right? So I think at times it's it's about learning to learning to persevere on the bits that you can control and and control what you can and, and not stress yourself out too much about the things that are sort of outside of your outside of your control, even if those are in some way having a um having an impact on your on your destiny. So doing those sort of um doing sort of those leading things, even when the outcomes might not be going in your direction and, and really sort of knowing when you, you know, when's the right time to keep doing the right thing, when to keep persevering and, and when to, um, when to have the willingness to sort of step back, reassess and, and see if what you're doing is the right thing. And if it is making you successful, I think is, um, is really key. Um, particularly if you're looking to have a, a, a very long, um, very long successful career in, in, a, in a sales role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I really understand what you mean there from that. That perspective of just having that focus on what, on what you need. Uh, Kirsty, I know you've got a slightly different view because obviously revenue ops, but I know you've probably worked with a lot of salespeople uh, over the years. So you have, a, you know, you definitely have a perspective on this. What, what, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I hate to be that person to kind of agree with the, the previous two. But yeah, when we were chatting about this before, um, the two that kind of stood, stood out to us were resilience and, and motivation. I think. Uh, one of the the facts of life is working in sales um, even if you are best in class if you're an SDR you're going to be being told no uh, probably 90 percent of the time and if you're an AE kind of 60 70 percent of the time so I guess resilience uh, as Chris said there are there are different uh, definitions to resilience but the resilience to kind of practice the skill of kind of dusting yourself off keeping going and keeping the motivation high is something that I think is a key uh, mindset within sales. And something that probably doesn't come naturally to to many of us, but something that we can we can work on. Yeah, that's interesting. Is it? Do you, you know, with your guys' perspective, do you think it can be a behaviour that's learned? You know, like a discipline that's learned to, you know, do that in terms of being having that motivation and that mindset. Do you think it's a learned behaviour or something that comes naturally? Um, from a RevOps perspective, I'll give the, the cliche answer. I think one thing that helps is bringing in process to that. So it, it's hard to just kind of coach. Coach, I'm sure Chris is is uh, skillful in coaching things like resilience. But from a RevOps perspective, if we can put together a B two B sales is a is a numbers game, isn't it? So if we can put together a process based off best practice, based off experience, based off knowing what works, that's something that we can provide the teams with from an enablement perspective to kind of give them the equipment and the tools that they need to be successful. Um, and then I guess they need to to fill in the rest. Is something that we can do from an ops perspective. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, Chris, from a coach perspective, do you think uh, you can coach mindset, motivation, that mentality? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, uh, some of it does come down to innate, but that often people believe, oh, I'm naturally this way, but it's probably not. It's probably from a childhood experience or life experience where someone has kind of taken that on and they don't directly correlate that with work. So, and I think it's very dangerous, particularly from a leader's and manager's point of view to refer to people in the team is this person's naturally good at this because that can create a fixed mindset for the rest of the team. If you're saying that 
we were working together, Tom, or I was managing you, and I was saying, you know, Tom's naturally good at cold calling or he's naturally good at presenting. Everyone else then's perception in that team is, well, I'm never going to be as good as Tom because he's natural at it. So no matter how hard I work on it, I'm never going to get to that level. So I think it's really important to, to encourage people to recognize that you can develop all of these. And like we were talking about resilience, it might not feel like it at the time, but the, the more you go through those changes and challenges, the, the better you'll be able to deal with them as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I've been doing like sales 20 years and I don't think anything comes naturally. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do, you've got to work, you've got to work hard at it, right? And improve. Um, so go on to the next question, which is like, why is mindset so important in sales? James, you've got a team, you're building a team at Aircall. Tell me why you think it's important in your, your team that you're building. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to really the, um, uh, your willingness to, uh, it sort of leads on to some of the other points that we made, is that mindset is key for you to be able to, to sort of take the knocks that are going to come from, from when you're building a team, um, particularly in a, in a sort of startup like we are or scale up like we are. A lot of the processes aren't there yet. A lot of the um, a lot of things aren't uh, aren't working quite as well as we would like to, like them to. We know that there's squeaky squeaky pieces. We know that there's friction. We know that the product's still growing, and we're still understanding the market. And I think you're going to get a lot of knockbacks as a result of that. And there's going to be a lot of times where you have to to handle that. You have to have the the motivation to keep going on that. You have to avoid being um, avoid seeing that as sort of totally knocking you off course and and sort of abandoning what you've um, what you've done. Uh, I think there's a really great James Clear quote that I'm probably going to butcher about you. You know, you fall down to the level of your systems, basically. And I think that's um, that's the piece that I think is is really key is that if you can um, if you can maintain that and hold on to that motivation and, and that um, that mindset, then you're you're going to set yourself up for success sooner or later, even if it's not coming as as, as quickly as you want it to. That's that's really insightful, James. You know, do, do you have a different view on that, Chris, in terms of like why mindset is so important just generally from your experience? Yeah, and I'm going to play a little game actually with everyone on here and yourselves and, and even everyone in the audience. Um, everyone feels comfortable closing their eyes. And if you are, even if I can't see you, um, if you're listening to this, closing your eyes. And on three, I'm going to pick someone to start singing off mute. One, two, three. You can open your eyes. I'm not going to pick anyone to start singing, but just share in the chat. What were some of the thoughts and feelings going on there? And I'll just give you some context as to why that's important, because what you'll probably find is a lot of us were thinking, oh, I'm nervous. My, I can't think straight. Like, what's going on? What song am I going to sing? We've always got a karaoke in the room. It's like, I know what I'm going to sing or happy birthday. But what's happening there is we've got this little part of our brain um, in our primal brain called the amygdala. It's like an almond shaped thing. And it sits there and it's known as amygdala hijack. And this will, you're not going to get asked to sing on a daily basis, but you are probably going to get calls that don't go well, emails that come in you didn't expect, conversations that happen at home before work. And when this amygdala goes off, it's a bit like a smoke alarm. It stops the front of our brain from thinking clearly. And this can disrupt no matter how good we are with what we do, all the process that we know that Kirsty was referring to, if we can't manage that amygdala, we're not going to be able to think straight and, and work through from it. So I think that's why mindset is so important because it, it builds that foundation. And if you can't manage that and recognize when you're veering off course you'll often then end up reacting to things rather than responding intentionally mm. it, i think that's so interesting when you talk about dealing with all those different things because like you want you i think people expect and want an employer these days who helps you deal with certain situations going on in your life but understanding and empathetic but at the same time as a salesperson to perform you kind of need to still be able to leave those things at the door to some extent we we're talking about this the other day it's for you to be able to focus and do your job you know so it's like how do you how do you manage that okay, you know which is the interesting part which will come on to some of the other questions um the last point um in terms of uh so the last question is is mindset one of the greatest threats to sales success you know Kirsty, do you want to go first this time uh, yeah, I can do. Uh, and first, and Chris, that was great to hear the theory behind my point about the uh, the process and structure. I'll definitely be using that in the enablement team uh, in the future. Um, I think with um, with motivation and m mindset in sales, I think sales is a pretty unique ish um, uh, role to be in. In that, if you're having an off day, because it's such a numbers game, as I was talking about at the beginning. If you're having an off day, it's immediately obvious in the in the numbers, whether it's your activities, whether it's your you know dials if you're an SDR through to also activities as a, as an AE and opportunities and pipeline, etc. So I think 
there's there's not very many places to hide um, when you're a sales rep, um, potentially unlike other roles. And I think as as a result, you could be having a bad day and it'll be immediately be noticed by your manager and immediately jumped on by a manager. So yeah, I think mindset is something that's incredibly important to the sales role compared to other sales role, other roles potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you summed that up well, Kirsty. I'll phrase it slightly differently to Chris and James. If you if you you're managing sales teams, like. Do you think it's, have you seen it where it stopped people being successful before? Have you actually seen it where you've hired people, brought them into the business? So we talk about mindset being one of the biggest threats. Have you actually seen it just have people basically fail, you know? Yeah, I, mean, I think from, from my side, I think the where, where it can really become challenging is when um, when people get too tied up in the, in the sort of outcomes and, and in some ways sort of the acclaim that comes from being uh, a successful salesperson. I think the... Um, Certainly, I've seen plenty of times where we've had successful, um, you know, really successful salespeople fail in following months or quarters because they've sort of, in a way, sort of reached the pinnacle of what they were shooting for at a time. And they, they, they got the level of acclaim. Maybe it wasn't quite what they were after. Maybe they didn't get the, the right level of external validation that, that, that they're after. And I think you can really see that not their confidence or not their their willingness to keep doing keep doing the same thing. I mean, to Kirsty's point, it's a, it's a it's a numbers game sales, but it's also a pretty repetitive game at times that you sort of be got to be prepared to do the same thing over and over again over over a long period. And I think if your if your mindset can, is is holding you back a little bit there, and if your confidence is too tied up in some of those more um, intangible things of am I getting enough acclaim? Am I doing you know am I getting the outcomes that I'm I'm after? Um, it's really easy to to see a, a peak in a trough, and I, I you know. I'm as guilty as this of, of as any, right? Of like, you know, you've chased a goal for a little bit, you may have achieved it, but um, what happens in the next um, months or, or quarters after that? And I think that can that can really help people, hold people back and take a long time to to recover from it. Sometimes it's the thing outside of the process in the sales management. Like, are you helping people goal set as much as you are managing the process? Chris, any, anything to add there before we move on? Yeah, I think a couple of things, what James is mentioning there, I mean, two of the biggest factors, I mean, this isn't obviously the topic of conversation, but that linked to burnout is a lack of self-recognition and neglecting non-work identities is, is you've become too reliant and dependent on external validation, recognition, too extrinsically motivated and not enough about what you're giving yourself. And if you don't do that, you won't, that feedback and the claim won't really resonate. It might feel good at the time, but you'll probably go back to not believing it afterwards. It'll feel like every day is a bit of like a knockout game rather than the league table where you've got, you know, all this form that you can rely upon and recognize. But I think it is a big threat. I think because, you know, you'll hire the hire people and they'll start great. And then all of a sudden something changes and that person hasn't necessarily put, like changed dramatically. It's more around the mindset probably. And that's not just saying it's down to them. It's of course down to the, the culture and leadership as well. But that's where those limiting beliefs can come in and really block someone from, to James's point, like focusing on the process, getting too tied up on that. And it can be the real stumbling block. I mean, I know we're going to talk about tool set, but the biggest tool we have is our minds. And if we can't, you know, develop that and support that in the right way, it doesn't matter what kind of tools we build around it. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think they're great, great points there. It's the other thing as well. There's a mindset of just, do I know how to do it? Do I think I just know how to do this job on autopilot? And then am I, am I actually you know, trying to get, trying to improve and get better. Awesome. Well, I'm excited about these polls, guys, because they make it fun. So the next poll uh, coming up next um, is, uh, here we go, sales skills, inherent or acquired? Over to the audience. It'll be interesting on this one. And you've got two choices, inherent or acquired. So we're talking about skill set now. Anyway, there is that. Interesting. Awesome. So everyone seems to have a consensus that it's acquired. Oh, here we go. So first question on this. Um, uh, what do you guys think? We'll just go a high level inherent or acquired. Um, James, do you want to start this time? Yeah, I agree with the poll. Um, acquired. <laughs> <laughs> There's a uh, probably an 80-20 split, but I think the vast majority of what makes you successful in a, in a sales role is, is stuff that you can acquire and that you can um, you can build on and you can learn as long as you're coachable and happy to take that stuff on. So would heavily lean on, on acquired with the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, what do you think inherent or acquired? Yeah, I think I kind of alluded to it earlier, so I won't go over too much, but I'd say acquired for me as well. Mm -hmm. 
Kirsty, are you going to go with the consensus? I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, that person again. Um, yes, I would say that a lot. I do agree with what uh, Chris said a minute ago about there's always one person who seems to make it look really easily and potentially <laughs> looks like they've got it innately. But um, there is a great book. Uh, we've talked about growth mindset a few times. There's obviously, the book by Caroline Dweck on growth mindset. I wrote, read that recently. And um, it may, kind of firmly made me believe by the end of it that people are, uh, uh, can achieve anything and develop any skills as long as they put the time and the effort um, and the, the various input into achieving those goals. Yeah, I think it's, what is it, 10,000 hours of yeah. anything and you become a master, uh, <laughs> whether that would be karate or demoing or, or whatever it may be. But yeah, if you put, if you put the time in, I, I do think some, you know, there is, I think you're talking about a percentage, almost like a percentage of people. So it's interesting you see a 90-10 split, you know, is so that because there's 10% of people who have a skill innate, uh, innately, you know, like they, uh, you know, and it's there, but interesting. So we'll move on to the next topic. Which skills are, and, and which, uh, sorry, which skills are a necessity for a salesperson to succeed? Chris, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, no, I, no, I think there's so many to talk about, but I, I want to talk about one that I think isn't spoken about enough. And it's probably getting more of a spotlight now, but energy management. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of focus on time management, but, you know, the, the old adage is time is money. But I think more importantly, time is energy and energy should be seen like your currency on a daily basis. And I often use the analogy. It's a bit like a phone battery. You know, some days you wake up 50 percent. Most of the time you wake up 50 percent, to be fair. Some days you wake up 100 percent. All these tasks, all these apps will drain your energy. And it's thinking like, where are you investing it? Back to James's point earlier on. Are you investing it in uncontrollables that aren't actually going to move you forward or be productive? And most importantly, how are you recharging it? You know, people get to the end of their day or middle of their afternoon and be like, I, I get so tired in the afternoon or at the end of the evening. I don't want to do anything. It's well, if you used your phone from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., it would die. And when we're going out for a night out, you might think, oh, I've got 40% of my phone battery. But you think, well, I probably should charge it because even though it's all right now, if we go out in the evening, it will die. But we don't think about that of our own energy. We'll kind of use it all up and then go, oh, now I need a break. But you don't wait for your car to need fuel before you fill it up. Well, you probably do at the moment. Um, but it's about being proactive. So I think it's really important to think, you know, you can allocate yourself two hours of getting from a to b but if you haven't got enough fuel in the tank you're not going to get there and different tasks require different energy so i think thinking more about how you manage your energy is a really important thing i've actually not heard it phrased like that before energy management uh but which is what you said which is really interesting to get people to think about it like that i know our head of sales is a big fan of tony robbins he talked about priming your day and doing the things that you need to do to be ready and, and stuff like that um Kirsty, over to you like what skills do you think are a necessity for sales um well I've picked a, a skill because I heard a stat the other day which really surprised me well didn't it kind of shocked me more than surprised me when I thought about it which was years ago when I kind of um we, we, I remember doing a, a study and, and looking into best practice and we worked out that about 33 percent of uh, sales reps so an AE or an SDR's time was spent on core selling activities and it was like it was like an internal initiative at my work to try and like you know bring in more efficiency and, and maximize the amount of time that reps were able to spend on on the core selling activities and that was a few years ago and I now I heard last week that apparently on average that's gone down to 25 percent based off a study of, of x number of people which kind of after thinking about it given that we've got so much tech in the world that should be going you'd hope that'd be going up but I guess with all of the distractions of kind of hybrid working all the different tech tools potentially as well um all of the different distractions on our time and all the different platforms that sales reps have to be present on and having a social presence and, and all the rest of it there's a lot more to be thinking about uh, so yeah apparently the time spent on on core selling activities is now at about 25 percent on average so I guess with that you know the ability to stay focused and, and time management and diary management I know my diary is a bit of a mess at the moment um, being able to like really be in control of that and kind of the ability to really spend the time where it's going to be efficient and and, and you're having the, the max impact on your pipeline and your, and your results is probably a real a real skill nowadays mm, yeah quality over quantity mm. the whole whole debate that we could go into over depending on what you're in what do you what do you think's in that thanks Kirsty. what do you think's in the set is necessity i can't say the word guys necessity, <laughs> necessity james uh, um, yeah, i get to do the um the boring bit of agreeing with everyone on this one which is i think time management and organization are, are key i really liked chris's point on on 
like considering your own energy on there as well. I think the you're in a fairly unique role in sales, and I think you're you've not only got prospects and customers who want to borrow your time all, um, th throughout the day. You've probably also got marketing who'd like to hear what you think about things or customer success who needs you on an existing customer or billing where they've got a problem or support or whoever. So you're, you're permanently sort of being dragged in different directions, I think, as a, as a salesperson and being able to figure out which of those ones you can um, minimize your time on so that you can focus on getting that 25% of actually customer facing time up is, is super key. Um, the only other one that I think I would add on really is, is sort of your communication and, and, and relationship building. Um, it's, it's obviously, I think everyone is, it's fairly obvious that it's a, it's a key skill from a, from an external perspective to be able to tell a, a prospect how your, your solution sort of impacts their business and be able to, you know, really succinctly ex ex expand on your value prop. Um, but I think at times we don't spend enough time thinking about the ability to communicate and build relationships internally with your, with your teams and your, your cross-functional partners. And I think the, the um, SDRs and, and account execs that I've seen who do a really good job and, and who are able to move away from that lone wolf sort of role into more of a quarterback are the ones who are over communicate with the, with the rest of the team. They, you know, they get ahead of, of where there's potential issues for, from a customer success perspective and they build those, um, they build those relationships early. And I think that really helps, you know, it's going to help you with your, with your win rate and it's going to help you take some of the load off your own plate that you, you otherwise sort of, you know, have on, on totally on your own shoulders, basically. Yeah. It's all about relationships. But what I'm hearing from all three of you is like, you know, is that a massive part of it. You've got to have all this inherent skill and be able to build up knowledge and experience over time. But this project management and time and management of your time, if you don't do that as a salesperson, then it's going to be very hard to be successful. Cool. The last question on this topic is when hiring, what is the most important uh, skill set or experience that you look for? Uh, Kirsty? you want to go first on this one mm, yeah um i think it depends um the stage like of the company and where you're at um and also the kind of who you are selling to i think we were chatting about before this so um if you're kind of looking for a if, if you're really early stage and you're looking for someone who can come in and just kind of hit like be really scrappy and you know they don't need to have perfect buyer personas uh, like uh, given to them and, and a perfect sales process and they can just kind of they've got the grit and determination to keep plowing away and, and work out that's probably some of the skills you'd be looking for um above the kind of the core ones that we've just been talking about uh but then if you're a much if you're a later stage company where things are a bit more established and maybe Maybe you're looking for someone to come in and be more of a, a coach to the younger, like maybe you're, you're promoting SDRs up to AEs. And um, we noticed at one point during our life cycle that we'd promote, it was great that we were promoting SDRs and it was fantastic to see those people growing with the company. But then we kind of had, it was taking them a little bit longer to, to ramp than it was the more experienced hires that we were making, even though they were internal and new, like the new signal and the new, our product and everything, they didn't have those core skills. So they need a lot of coaching. We were kind of missing a bit more of the experience side. Um, so then we were actually looking for someone to come in and who would be able to be a bit more autonomous and, and really kind of have that enterprise view because we were really missing that as a skill set as well so I think it depends where you are as a company and also um the kind of the the, the rest of the team where they're all at as well mm -hmm. yeah you get sit on the fence on that one depending on the size of the team and the vertical I get I get that to some extent Chris what do you think uh, is more important skill, skill set or experience yeah, and no, I suppose I'll and I completely agree with what Kirsty was saying there. I'm going to be that person who says it now as well. <laughs> um, but I suppose from my perspective, coming at it from a different angle, I think it's all about context and you know experience. That we just presume, presume that experience is a good thing, but it isn't always. You know, and and saying that, that you know this person's got two or three years experience, but they might have had experience of being there for two or three years. But what have they actually gathered in that, those two or three years? Like how have they performed? Are they someone that is maybe? toxic to the culture and you know yes they've got three years experience but they're actually going to have a negative impact on the rest of the team so you know i use this example when you think about football i'll just use it once i won't use a football analogy again but you know when you talk about people going to a world cup and they'll be like oh this person's got experience of previous tournaments but if the team haven't performed well do you really want that around the camp is that is that really beneficial is that actually going to have a negative impact so i think it's really important to think about the context the same with skill set and also there's a lot more conversation around now, for example, like diversity and inclusion in itself. And this is just devil's advocate is putting two or three years experience, not going against that on like a, a job application form, for example. Like, is that really being inclusive if you are asking someone to have that experience? Because it depends what they've done 
within that time. So yeah, that's my kind of take on it. Interesting. What, what do you think, James? On yeah, the, I mean, I think to on 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 every um, I think everyone's everyone's looking for like that, that magic person that brings both, right? And I think you, if you read any job description, it's going to say two or three years experience, and then a long two hundred bullet point list of all the um, mentality things that you want a person to to bring at the same time. Um, I think I think for me, I would agree with Kirsty, on, on, and it's, it totally depends on on what stage you're at. But if it, if it was me and I had to make a firm choice, I would always go on. Um, Always go on the sort of the the skill the mentality and the, and the skill set side versus the experience piece. I think you can you can you can coach in um, experience. You can't do it the other way around. I don't think it as as easily. And I think we've um, probably all seen people who on paper have got the perfect CV come and join a join an organisation and, and not succeed because it's just not the right yeah you know, through through potentially nobody's fault. It's just not the right fit. It just doesn't doesn't particularly work. And I think. Um, yeah, now that I know we're allowed to use football analogies, I think if you've got your Trent Alexander Arnold in the team, um, like you don't want to bring in somebody who's going to block their progress and, and prevent them, you know, with all the right skill sets from, from being able to grow in your organization because you're um you, you know you were looking for the, that sort of magic amount of experience all the time. And I think that's you, you potentially hold yourself back there if you're too fixated on that. Mm. I yeah, I see what you think, what you're saying there and coming from a slightly different perspective. It depends on the stage of business you're at and then you know, what sort of mindset and mentality do you need for that stage of the company or what type of company it is? So it's almost like a completely different angle uh, from that perspective. Awesome. Right. So Kirsty's favourite, we're going to go on to tool set now and talk about tech stacks. Um, so poll number three, how many tools um, do you have in your sales uh, stack? You've got to quickly count them up because I'm not sure the Zoom poll lasts that long. So uh, quickly count up how many, how many tools do you have in your sales tech stack? I'm super interested to see the results on this. Okay, 15 seconds. Here we go. Three, two, one. Interesting. So over 50% have got four to six, which is interesting. That was smaller. Cool. Awesome. All right, guys. So how many uh, how many tools do you have in this uh, tech stack? Um, so guys, just quick round, Robin. Uh, how many have you got? <laughs> can you remember off the top of your head, Kirsty? How many have you got in your text stack? I can remember because it's in a job advert that we've put out. <laughs> and the first question that everyone always asks is, "What are those nine tools?" So we have we have nine tools. Candidates are always, and then it puts me to the test trying to name them all. <laughs> oh, cool, oh, nine. What about you, James? Uh, cool. Uh, I think I'm still counting ours, but sort of certainly <laughs> upwards of nine, ten. Um, there's a there's a good number of them probably four or five that are core to a, to an AE's day-to-day -day, I think and and uh obviously Chris I know you're running your own business but in the previous in your previous role how many did was it like nine um ten? well I've got five at the moment that's uh, oh, yeah. um I can't remember how many before but yeah it was probably around like eight to ten I'd say cool awesome so we're going to kick off with the first question of how to build a winning tool set so Kirsty do you want to go first on this one I can, and uh, I could talk about this a long, uh, for a long time because I've probably made every single mistake <laughs> that there is out there, and uh, and each time try and avoid those mistakes when we bring in a new tool. So, I think in terms of starting from scratch, so building out a winning tool set. Um, I think the key thing is to to start off by knowing your business as well as you can. In the, in the early days, that could be really basic stuff, but have a good idea of where are you doing well and where you're doing badly against kind of best practice or um, a funnel. And then start with um, the kind of the minimum viable product to solve your pain points. And I think we've all been in the in the scenario where, you know, um, your CEO or an investor or your boss thinks that you should bring in a new tool and it's kind of because it's part of the same portfolio as you and it sounds really jazzy and it might do some really cool things. Um, but kind of the, the key thing is, I think, focusing on what's going to what are your pain points or where do you want to focus on improving? Because in the early days, there might be many, many, many pain points. So it might be kind of right. Where are you going to focus and how are you going to solve that problem? Um, not just bringing in tools that sound quite cool or that you've heard other people getting value from. Is it is it the right tool for your business? And I think we've talked, I've heard people talk about, um, is it a painkiller or a vitamin? So is it kind of something that actually solves a problem for you or is it something that, you know, is a little bit, you'd, you'd less see the, the, um, the results of it. 
And I think sometimes people are quick to put tools in place kind of as the easy solution. And I think taking the time to understand the challenges of your business or of your team um, and then also look to see if, if you could actually change um, process. Could that achieve the same results, for example? Mm-hmm. Um, so find if you um, basically find a problem, find a tool that's going to fix it. And it's not something that's going to paper over the cracks as well, because there's examples like... Um, spending a fortune on um you know data providers especially out in america the the t- tools that we use over there are some of the most expensive tools in our toolbox um in terms of getting good quality data for our, our um addressable market but actually is the issue that we're kind of we don't I, we don't understand our icp well enough and we're kind of just spraying and praying which is why we're burning through accounts and, and the reps are shouting for for more data so really just starting by uh, buying tools that are going to solve your pain points and help you grow as a business bring that one in then then bring in another tool and then focus on the next one measure the results roll it out properly you know rolling it out properly and getting leadership buy-in is another key mistake that that I've made in the past where you kind of spend ages getting this tool in and building it all out and then if you cut any corners in the rollout it may end up ultimately end up being a tool that a doesn't work very well because it doesn't integrate properly with Salesforce for example or it's a bit clunky or the reps just don't use because they don't see the value in it so there's loads there's loads of ways you can make mistakes but investing the time and buying the right tool rolling out in the right way and ideally in my opinion making sure everything integrates into salesforce so you've got a single source of truth those are kind of the three um boxes that i would try and tick and, and be mindful of whenever bring it whenever you're bringing in new technology there's lots of other things um but those are probably the three main things that i've learned mm-hmm. yeah i love that selling a bit uh are you selling a vitamin or a painkiller mm-hmm. i've sold vitamins it's a lot harder uh, <laughs> than it is selling painkillers uh james what do you what do you think on building a winning yeah i I think a winning tool set is the one that sort of fits into your sales workflow basically and i I think the um we've all had um i think all of us have been at companies that have been around for longer than four or five years uh you end up with quite a collection of different tools scattered around maybe a a marketing tool that nobody in the sales team ever looks at and marketing aren't quite sure why they aren't getting the value from that or you've got a um you've got a sales engagement tool but you've only sort of optimized 20 percent of it and, and you're only getting you're only using it for templates or something along those lines so um i think if you if you've entered a position where in order to use all these tools you've got to end up with sort of 10 chrome tabs open you, you're doing it wrong i think the um the the, the really working tool set and tool stack should be the one that um she really feels like your reps don't notice it i think in in their day-to-day it almost becomes sort of just behind the um, behind the scenes to, to what you're doing and just increases productivity rather than you ending up, um, I don't know, copy and pasting the same thing into four different places or having to do three different screens for your pipeline review or something along those lines. That, that, that's, um, that's, I think, where it starts holding you back rather than, um, than helping you build that foundation. Cool. So ma- making sure it's uh, obviously optimised for best practice and making sure that you really need it. Chris, have you got anything to add on how you build a winning tool set? Yeah, and I think it echoes Kirsty and James's points, particularly the first point with Kirsty talking about the problem is start with the problem, not the tool. I think a lot of the time, you know, we will teach people in our sales teams to do this, you know, don't just go in and pitch something like find the problem. But then sometimes you'll be like, oh, let's go and just buy this tool. It's, it's a bit of FOMO sometimes. You might hear about it and more people using it, but it's, do you really need that? Like, what's the actual problem, first of all? Because it might mean you don't need that tool. Or you might not need the tool at all. Um, that sounds weird to say. Uh, secondly, I think also just don't overcomplicate it. I think, you know, when we're talking about skill set earlier on and mindset, sometimes you can introduce too many tools at once and it can make someone too dependent on those tools. Whereas what you really want to do is to enable someone to recognize that it's coming from them. It's starting from their skill set. It's not just down to these tools. And that's what can overcomplicate it a lot of the time is thinking, can we still operate? Can we still be successful? Is this a must or is this a a nice to have going back to you know Kirsty's analogy I love around the painkiller and the vitamin so yeah I think those are a couple of things to, to echo those points yeah it's, a, it's almost like each tool has an optimum time to put it in depending on your size and when you need it maybe you should write a book on this Kirsty and you can tell people <laughs> when, to, when to put in each tool at what time um so next question guys uh why might your tool set not be delivering value um James do you want to start this one yeah, you stole my thunder a little bit there, Tom, because I think the, 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 like the, the order that you put your tool stack in and, and the, um, the, the plumbing that you put in to, to really make it work is, is sort of the key. And I think the, um, a, lot of this, a lot of the stuff that makes your tool set 
uh, really work is the is the really unsexy stuff that lives in the background and that you don't really spend too much time on, but makes all of your um, makes all of your other more exciting, more eye grabbing um, or attention grabbing tools um, work properly. So, for me, I think things like you know nailing your nailing your lead scoring before you start worrying too much about um, you know building you know spending loads of time building out sequences into a, a sales engagement tool is is key or you know making sure that you've got your attribution up and running properly before you're spending too much time trying to do deep dives analysis into some into a BI tool or that sort of thing, I think is, is really important that you don't end up spending too much time on something that's sort of patchy and, and unhelpful because you didn't do the, the plumbing, first of all, to, to make it all actually um, worthwhile, really. Yeah. So like if Salesforce isn't working or every, like Kirsty talked about it being central to everything, how can you go and get a BI tool for the whole business if Salesforce doesn't tell the truth exactly the way you want? Because the BI tool won't tell the truth. I can totally get it. Cool. What, what do you what do you think, Kirsty, on um, uh, what might uh, stop delivering value for your tool set? Um, I, I agree with what, what James said. Just to add to it, the one of the things that's coming out um, more and more is the hiring of a, and I would say this of course, but uh, hiring of a, a senior RevOps person early enough from from a company or um having a rev ops function as opposed to a, a sales ops function a marketing ops function and the luxury of a, a cs ops function for some companies that have that um and it's the it's the kind of the reason for it is to have that overall picture view of the whole revenue all the way from an inbound lead through to a renewal making sure that all the whole ecosystem of tools that you've brought in speak to each other the, that you're not introducing these pockets of revenue loss. Um, I've heard it being described by Forrester, um, where you've kind of got the handover from um, marketing and, and to SDRs, to sales, to CS, and every time there's a handover, there's an opportunity to kind of lose revenue out the funnel there. So by having a really integrated um, stack of tools that actually talk to each other and work and complement each other um, instead of being siloed uh, is something that a RevOps person should be able to, to bring to the, to the company. Um, and a very uh, in a more tactical sense of the word, uh, something that I'm acutely feeling the pain of at the moment is um, not using out of the box features. When you bring in a tool, use as many out of the box features as you can. So we our Salesforce was built initially by an engineer, actually not not anyone in ops or sales or anything like that. And he did a great job of making it perfect for the company at the time, but it wasn't future proofed really uh, in in any way actually so we're kind of feeling the pain of that every time we're trying to integrate with a new tool um we have problems every time we try to connect it and, and get accurate reporting and compare our salesforce reporting to say our outreach reporting there's always a disconnect there and it's because of that um, we're always using custom fields and custom ways of doing things um so yeah tactical point a bit of advice just use use out the box features where it makes sense to and don't avoid yeah. search it'll be too complicated Exactly. So that's a really interesting point. So you're gonna what was it in the poll? Nine to ten tools. So mm. what are you spending? Somewhere between six to nine grand per rep per year. You know, you see the data then why would you not invest in someone who's gonna help you manage it properly when you look at a salary and everything? It's just classic, it happens in lots of situations. Um uh so I'm conscious of time and there's quite a few questions popping in. So I'm gonna move on to the last question. Um uh Chris, let's go with you first. So what tech uh, can you not live without? If you have to have three tools, you've got five, you can only have three of them, as you said. So which three can you not live without? Um, I'd probably say video would be one for me, like a, a good sort of video platform. I think that's something that's really helped me and I think can help a lot of people, particularly in this noisy environment of um, having, you know, to stand out really uh, above the crowd. From do you, do you mean video like a uh, Vidyard or a Bombo? Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Just one, one is very neutral, but yes, they, there are, yeah, <laughs> those. Um, yeah. I think, you know, not just saying this because of, of yourself, Tom, but I think like conversation intelligence, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's, and I, I was at a talk this week and someone used the analogy of, you know, imagine a, going back to sport, I'm not going to use football, but sport, imagine a manager like, you know, training his team for the week, but he's never actually seen them play the game. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's not going to be um, successful. You're just walking in blind really a lot of the time. So I think understanding and also for people to understand themselves, like going back to that growth mindset and how to develop and skill set, you know, having that historic way of being able to go back and show them their own progression is a really effective tool. And then third, um, you know, this is just from a wellbeing perspective, but just having focus mode for me, like that's one of my best tools. I think going back to our, Kirsty and James's point at the start of that time management and prioritizing is 
being able to turn off those distractions and and giving myself that that time and that that space to build that energy um is really important focus mode is that something on your browser or tool you can have it on you can have it on um it's like a desktop add-on or you can get it on your phone um and you can set times you can decide what apps go into that as well so you can just have the ones you need and still have your phone on you for emergencies but you're not getting all those pop-ups and distractions that's cool that's interesting yeah and that analogy there about take it away from sport is like a uh, you know, a music teacher not listening to their pupil play an instrument. That's a bit odd. Anyway, cool. Kirsty, what, what are your top three? Yeah, I wish Chris hadn't said that because this is going to look like this set up now. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, uh, for me, top one is a CRM. If you want to scale and if you want to be a, re a really big company, I, I'm yet to be convinced. I know that other uh, CRM providers are kind of getting better and improving. and, and But I, I'm yet to be convinced that you shouldn't bring in Salesforce as early as possible to avoid a really nasty migration further down the line. Um, so CRM, and then secondly, which is the bit that now sounds like we've, we've planned this, is the call recording and call intelligence software. Um, but the reason I say it is because if you're a company that's growing, you're probably going to be hiring, and, and especially after the great resignation, you're still probably going to be hiring. Um, so onboarding, being able to give like a library of best-in-class calls can really fast forward the onboarding and letting people get up to speed instead of the old way of, and this is how we used to do it, when a new rep starts, just be like trying to convince the other reps to let them shadow us like their calls which isn't half as scalable uh, and you also can't control what they're listening to either so um and also go to markets measuring how well the, the messaging is landing stuff like that you can all do that at scale with their call recording call intelligence software uh, and lastly i went for um a kind of sales engagement platform like an outreach or a sales loft because that just enables the reps to like prospecting is a fundamental of the business and and some a tool like that enables them to plan their day and um do do so at scale really instead of having disparate um reps doing different things yeah i get it you're looking at the core core functionality there it's really mm -hmm. helpful great tips james anything different or like anything? no it's super super boring unfortunately i totally agree with, with kirsty i think we, i think CR, crm is not a very exciting one but you i think impossible to to do without i think um conversational intelligence sounds like a pitch but i think it's the i don't remember how how it was to ramp um sales like new joiners before um before we had tools like this it must have been impossible and i assume we were doing a very bad job of it um but just the you know getting people on getting on board fast and, and making sure that we actually understand what's working and what isn't is is huge and then sales engagement again yeah i mean an outreach or a sales loft not not just for your prospecting but i think also for helping to build out your your workflow there and thinking about what your you know what extra data you can insert into your um uh, into your sales process and how you can sort of templatize that that process as, as much as possible particularly for those who are, uh, have a big SMB presence, um, mm -hmm. I think is, is really key. Anything you can do there to reduce the manual work and, and push some of that into the tool and, and, and make that a bit more repeatable is, is um, a huge, huge time saver for a, for a rep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm old enough to remember when you used to have to be in the office five days a week and you went and picked people face to face. Uh, so that, that's how we used to do it in the old days. Uh, Cool. Thank you so much, guys. They, they're really interesting. I love the polls and everyone in the audience who engaged. That was fantastic. We have uh, three questions from the audience because we have a little bit of time for Q&A, which is nice. Um, so the first question, I'm just going to go through these quick, quick fire, guys. We've got a couple of minutes left. So this is for all panellists. What are some of the practical tips you have for anyone looking to master a better sales mindset? I think this has got to be for you, Chris. Go on. Over to you. <laughs> um so many things i think one of the, the simplest things i always suggest people is challenging your self-talk so mm -hmm. on average we speak about 130 words per minute but our self-talk's about 800 to 1200 words per minute so very noisy um and i think one of the best things to do is when you are in a certain headspace is thinking am i feeding myself statements or am i asking myself questions so our mind's a bit like a google search engine anything you type in it's going to come back with evidence so if you're typing in statements i'm not going to hit my target i'm not going to have a good day this deal is not going to go through you can look for all the evidence of confirmation bias to back it up. If you ask questions about how can I hit my target? How can I have a better day? How can I turn this deal around? You're going to look for possibilities. So I think that's the first step there is just thinking and even encouraging your team. If you've got managers on the call or colleagues of going, is are you feeding yourself statements or are you asking yourself questions? Yeah. One line that someone told me a little while ago that I use all the time is the story I'm telling myself, Chris, is what you, you know, so you're putting it back on. Brene Brown, uh, yeah. 
yeah 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 which is a fantastic line to help people think like think like that um next question is actually specifically to kirsty no thanks for that uh chris kirsty how do you balance managers needs such as visibility of the day-to-day -day activity with reps needs and getting them to buy in what is valuable to them oh good question um i guess the if you design the right process it should uh deliver both you know if you've if you've set out um if we're talking about uh you said count number of activities and visibility of activities so i guess if you're talking about prospecting um going back to what we just said about outreach if we have a bet if we have um an icp that we we've or we've guided the the reps to prospect and we've given them a process to use obviously not a not a script but something that they can use as a guide to go away and prospect then that should be delivering the reporting that the managers need it shouldn't be anything additional it, it should be something that answers both of those needs and um yeah i guess that's it, it really comes down to the process mm -hmm. cool in terms of them getting their buy-in uh you know is there any way that you would spend time with them or any way like especially if it's like the sales manager or leadership would you would you do anything special or different with them or... um i mean i work very very closely with um all the vps of sales so we 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 should generally be pretty i mean we obviously we we have conflicts and we have um disagreements and things like that but we're generally aligned on we have a very clear business goal and we have a very our cco makes it very clear what are the three um we have our ceo lays out what are the three priorities for the business our cco my boss lays out what are the three priorities for the commercial team and we know that as a commercial team we're working towards those goals so it makes the conversations around prioritizing and uh, the decision making that we're doing a lot easier because we're all working towards the same goals uh in, in theory that's awesome um last question uh there are so many tools out there in your experience, what type of sales tech, web tech tools would you say are a must or a need to have? I think we've already answered that one with the top three tools. Uh, so I think we answered that question. We've got left a little bit at the end. Uh, but guys, is there anything you want to add on that in terms of like must have uh, sales tech or revenue tech that you maybe started using recently or, or have seen maybe across sales or marketing? Anything you think is a must have? I think well, it's, it depends on your business, doesn't it? So, like, what's a what's a must have to my my business might be uh, a, a nice to have to someone else. Um, but I have just seen we've just brought in a new tool, which is very exciting. Um, which for us, we work we sell to predominantly at the moment PR and comms team people, and within that, uh, we've seen a huge success rate of people leaving and, and going to a different company and bringing uh, signal in. So we've just brought in a tool that integrates. You can of course do this manually, and you can have your lists in sales nav. Um, but we've brought in a tool that plugs into our CRM and into um, various data sources, <laughs> including uh, LinkedIn. Um, and it highlights if one of our contacts who is classed as a customer in Salesforce um, has a has come up as a new starter somewhere else so that it marks the it also helps us with cleanliness um, of the data because it marks the current contact as um, no longer a company it creates a new contact on the new company and creates a new account if, if appropriate and then it alerts the sales rep in outreach and says um, here's a template one of your contacts has, has been um, has got a new role here uh, do you want to consider sending this activity to them or contacting them whatever whatever we want to set it up mm. as which for us could be a really positive impact on our pipeline this year we believe because referrals we see have a higher conversion rate um and a slower um faster deal cycle so we're hoping that we'll actually have a, an impact on our numbers this year but that's something that's kind of specific to us i guess in our industry uh, it wouldn't necessarily work for everyone if you're in an industry where people don't use linkedin as much for example i've, I've seen it uh, a few things like that actually and i i totally agree there's that that does that change management in a deal? People changing jobs, people mm. who bought you previously. So actually knowing where your your kind of fan base or following is moving around and being yeah. able to start to track that is something that's going to get more and more apparent. But yeah, there well, are there we're are also just to add, yeah, we're also hoping it'll have a big impact for our CS team because of course for them to know that one of their customers has actually left the business is a key bit of information when it comes to renewal. You don't want to find like three months down the line when it comes to renewal conversations, that actually your main contact is left. We want to be ahead of those conversations. So it's also going to add impact in other areas of the business as well. That's great, Kirsty. Thanks for sharing. Thanks so much, everyone, for attending. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists. That We really appreciate your brilliant input and tips. I think, you know, to hear your views on, on mindset and skill set and 
the tools that you need. I hope that everyone who was on here today got loads of valuable insights. I definitely learned some things, which is always great. Um, if you'd like to reach out to any of the panelists, you can do. Uh, you can find them all on LinkedIn. And obviously, we'll send the recording over to everyone um, uh, in the next day or two. But thank you very much for your time, everyone. It was a great session. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, all. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye, bye.